It's uh, my great pleasure to host a conversation tonight between Imani Jacqueline Brown and Bob Sneed. Imani, uh, to my far left, is an artist, activist, cultural organizer, and director of programs at Antenna, New Orleans. In 2014, Imani co-founded Blights Out, a collective of citizens, artists, architects, and activists who imagine a new model for development that generates art and action to impact issues of blight, gentrification, and housing affordability, which I know is a really pressing issue in New Orleans and lots of other cities. That same year, she worked as curatorial associate and manager of publications for Prospect 3, the third iteration of the International Biennial of Contemporary Art in New Orleans. And uh, by the way, Dan Cameron, who's curating our thesis show this year, was the curator of Prospect 1, the first uh, edition of that, that biennial. And I guess he's sort of a co-founder of it in a way. Yeah, founding director. The founding director, OK. Um, Imani's paper, Performing Bare Life, Occupying the Liminality Between Civilizations, was named the 2014 Best in Stream concept, the best in stream, uh, at the fifth annual Latin American and European meeting on organization studies in Havana, Cuba. In 2015, Imani was a resident at IBEAM in Brooklyn. She's currently a member of Occupy Museums, whose project, Debt Fair, is featured in the current Whitney Biennial. She received a BA in Visual Arts and Anthropology from Columbia University in 2010. Bob Sneed is an artist and executive director at Antenna, New Orleans. In 2002, he founded Redux Contemporary Arts Center in his hometown of Charlestown, Charleston, rather, South Carolina, and remained director of the organization until 2005. In 2007, he helped form the traveling artist collective Transit Antenna, and spent the next two years developing community-based art projects across North America. Since 2010, Bob has lived and worked in New Orleans, continuing a studio practice and exhibiting across the US while also creating a support system for the artists and writers of New Orleans and beyond through his role at Antenna. He's a founding organizer of the arts, of the art grant organization Platforms Fund, as well as Common Field, a national service organization for artist-centric organizations. He was selected for the 2014 Art Fields Jury Prize and you can check out his work on the PBS series Art Assignment, which is a really amazing um, web series um, that you can find on YouTube and also by just Googling um, Art Assignment. Uh, it's produced in, um, in St. Louis, um, and I, I really recommend it highly. Bob received a BA in 2002 from the College of Charleston, where he graduated cum laude, and an MFA in 2007 from Yale. Please join me in welcoming Imani Brown and Bob Sneed. All right, so we're gonna um, we're gonna kind of do a, a, a thing where we each present for a short time, and then we're gonna come together and talk about our work at Antenna, and then we'll go from there. Um, so I'm going to start out, and then Imani will jump in right behind me. Um, I like to start with this project um, uh, just because it, it really does uh, kind of color um, how, I, how I thought of work um, early on. I was really m more concerned with um, uh, comic timing than, than art. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and a lot of the, the work I was creating um, was more rooted in the language of uh, stand-up comedy, um, really inspired by the work particularly of Richard Pryor um, and his, um, uh, uh, the, the moment with which he set himself on fire and did a whole set um, based on the, that, that moment. Um, so this, this piece like really shapes um, my uh, relationship uh, with my parents, and then, um, and then uh, I, I recently this this project also started. I started this project in 2005, um, and just recently came back to it. So this um, it kind of adds the the um, the postscript of um, of the project and sort of this 
um, relationship um, that uh, that never never really was all that great to begin with. Um, so um, this is another another piece. Um, uh, again, in that in that same language, the this this is a, actually an earlier piece than that project, um, and then uh, and, and it was all like with uh, with friends and family um, shaping uh, a narrative about um, about these these people that I knew and 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 the kind of hidden hidden things within their their world. Um, in 2002, after uh, after graduating uh, college, I started this organization, which Mark explained, uh, Redux Contemporary Art Center. Um, this is a project that I actually, a uh, mural project I did later on after leaving the organization with another founder. Um, we produced this mural in the space. But this uh, this doing this project really shaped the way that I uh, thought about art making and, and a practice and, um, and it all really like folded in to, uh, to what I was uh, doing. And so a lot of the, the artists that I was working with at um, Redux would end up becoming a part of the, the work that I was um, making. So Daryl, uh, it was funny like hearing someone sleeping on the couch. Daryl slept in his studio um, uh, for the entire length that he was a renter, um, despite us not being allowed to, do, to have that um, in the space. And then we would also produce um, work uh, that, that was really about um, uh, raising money for this organization that, that we were starting as college kids. So this was a, a fun, part of a fundraiser that we did. Um, uh, the show was called uh, Hard Artist Take It Off, and it was uh, uh, all nude self-portraits for us to raise money for an air conditioning unit for this organization. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of people were not really interested in buying work of us <laughs> naked. So it wasn't that great as a fundraiser, but it was a really great idea. Um, and then I went off to school and left the organization. And um, I, in, in talking to some of the, the students um, today, I... Um, I remember that moment of, of feeling like floundering in the first years of, of school, even the second year of school, and um, really sort of like regretting the move because I had started this organization and it was totally fine and I could have done um, just, just fine in Charleston. And actually in the back of this, you can't really see because it's a little, uh, it's a small image, but uh, Redux is burning in the background there. And oh, and I should say like, I was, when I was painting this, I was thinking, like, initially when I started painting, I was like, my future's so bright, I gotta wear shades, like that song. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then in uh, New Haven, um, I, uh, I, I was doing all kinds of projects. This was our first experience in New Haven. There's, there's actually a guy getting a blowjob in the back of the, in the park there. <laughs> That was happening in a car, but it, di it, 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 w it didn't really work in the painting, so I changed it a little bit. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, this is a project that I did just sort of, um, uh, it was a, an ATM machine kind of uh, depicting all of my kind of angst in grad school. And so it's an ATM machine that no longer wants to be an ATM machine and is uh, trying its career at, a, at being a stand-up comedian. Um, and uh, and, and I, I, I placed it in some spaces and then also took it on tour to open mics around the area. Um, and then at the same time, I was also organizing with uh, friends and family, like my son is actually standing there behind me with a sign. This is a pro Walmart rally that we organized in New York um, for the, uh, for the um, art, art fair, um, the, uh, the Deitch Project, or the art, um, not the art fair, sorry, the art parade, yes, that uh, Deitch Projects organized for a couple years. Um, and then we uh, organized this project soon after, the next year, um, uh, attempting to lift uh, Jeffrey Deitch with, um, with balloons, with uh, regular size balloons, and it was a 
monumental failure, but we did get into the um, uh, New Yorker. Um, that is uh, on the far, far uh, le your left. It would, my, my butt is in that picture, so I'm a little famous there. And then after grad school, I hopped on a bus um, with a, a group of, um, of uh, fellow artists in my family, and we traveled cross country. Um, and uh, I didn't shave my beard for two years, so that's me about halfway through. Um, and we lived on this bus and lived and worked, uh, developed a space um, that we could make art um, and just traveled and saw the country. Um, and for many of you who don't have an, a clear picture of what you're gonna do, I highly recommend this. Um, just jumping in a car and just seeing the country and exploring, and a lot of it we did um, this, these are images of, of uh, our uh, waste vegetable oil collection system um, that we, that I, a lot of the art that I was making at the time was shaped around this because we spent so much time collecting waste vegetable oil to travel on. Um, that was the majority of our time. This is a, a graphic depiction of that um, that then got turned into a t-shirt. And again, this is us like, uh, or Seth and Jamie uh, that I was traveling with, uh, this is a painting that I did um, based on uh, cleaning filters, um, which was uh, so much time. Um, and during that time also we created, all of us created work um, uh, every day. So this is just a sampling of, um, of this, this grid. We would all make these eight by eight inch pieces um, uh, based on our experiences. So this is Alex who had actually printed the, the t-shirt um, and I, I didn't really like Alex all that much uh, when I first met him. Um, and, uh, and then there's a, there's a little, you, you can hardly see it on the side because um, it's painted actually just in a, in a sheen. It says, um, uh, looks kind of like the dude from Memento. <laughs> um, yeah, just a, another painting, paintings of people that we met. Um, and then we also um, uh, did these projects uh, in, in places that were exciting to us. So this was in Salton Sea. Um, we uh, sailed the Salton Sea. It was a, it's a, um, a, a man-made lake that um, has uh, the salt content so high that they have um, mass red tides every summer um, because it's in the middle of the desert in Southern California. And so no one uses the, the, this, this massive body of water and so we decided to sail across. It's about 15 miles across. Um, and then uh, we did this project halfway through um, uh, trying to write all of the things we screwed up. Um, so this is sort of like a rewrite of history. Um, we had at, at one point, the, uh, one of the wheels fell off of the bus and we almost died. Um, Seth and I uh, fought all the time. So this, the big picture is uh, of us hugging it out because um, you, know, you gotta fix it all. And then uh, we also uh, recreated the moon landing for the 40th anniversary of the moon landing um, in Regent, North Dakota, um, out of found material. Um, did a lot of slow moon walking. And uh, to, to fund that expedition, we did uh, all kinds of random uh, Craigslist jobs. So. Um, we, this was 2007 to 2009, so, um, we, and we did have internet on the bus, um, it was a full working house, and so, uh, we would get these jobs, but almost every Craigslist job that we ever got, um, turned into some other kind of job, so, uh, Armand wanted a tile setter, and he got a lumberjack, um, I built a pot, uh, a ramp for this potbelly pig in Portland, Oregon. And then we, uh, we worked for a butcher um, in Alaska, um, right outside of Anchorage. Um, and uh, this is Doug, the proprietor there. And then eventually the bus died in, uh, right actually outside of Salton, uh, the Salton Sea. And so we decided to bury it and it's still there. Well, uh, Seth 
who I was traveling with um, just recently visited it and there's um, there's actually a whole community around the bus now and they still use it it's uh, we buried it but um, we corrected all of the surfaces so this is about a 15 degree angle that it's buried in um, and then we went in and um, corrected all the, the beds and everything so you can still use the space. And then once I uh, got off the road, I, I had that sort of moment where I was floundering a little bit, so, and it was like right, right in the thick of the recession, and so I started this random project um, creating uh, wallets that were recession-proof. So they had a, a, dollar, or a $20 bill stitched inside that you couldn't remove. Um, and then uh, the outsides were uh, depictions of people's stories. So uh, Josh was a, a wealth management um, uh, uh, advisor who had lost his job. And then uh, Kenneth was uh, this uh, father of a, of, of a kid who had cystic fibrosis and he'd always work on muscle cars. So I, I kind of, um, translated, I, I did a big open call for stories and then translated their stories on these surfaces. And then uh, moved to New Orleans um, and uh, this is just a random one-off project um, uh, posing as a spaceman needing money in the middle of the night. And uh, I, I ended up creating this project because we really crash landed in New Orleans. We had no plan and so uh, this is uh, developed from all of the uh, moving boxes of our move. And um, it was uh, depicting a crash that I'd witnessed um, when I was touring our first apartment, um, kind of recreating this, 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 uh, this wreck out of all of the cardboard. And then that project grew into this, this project of recreating all of the products of a family dollar, it, well, the project's called Family Dollar General Tree, and it's taking all of the cardboard waste from dollar stores and recreating a dollar store. Um, at that time, I was also working for Lynn Emery, who's this uh, kinetic artist in New Orleans. Um, and uh, she's now 90 and still in the studio every day. It's quite inspiring. And also teaching um, at that moment. Um, and then that's when I got involved uh, uh, with uh, antenna with their annual event drawathon, which we'll talk about a little more in, in a bit. Um, and my wife and I also started a bakery, so this is our our daughter, who's now three, um, in the bakery working. So all of this sort of merges together in a in a pot of of creativity. Um, and I still make paintings. So these are uh, paintings of now friends that I've made in um, New Orleans. Um, more just about uh, falling asleep with electronics and in your work environment. Um, that's my son and our, our dog. And then uh, just the, the kind of r the refuse of uh, everyday domestic life. And that's it. So it's kind of funny going after Bob, who's like a real artist or something. Um, Cause I am, yeah, I am like struggling with the idea of calling myself an artist, which is why I call myself a cultural organizer. Um, I used to make art when I was uh, growing up uh, all through high school and in college. I used to make stuff. I used to do a lot of charcoal drawing and some uh, sculpture, found objects and stuff, and I loved it, uh, but I never ever thought that I was going to like become an artist, uh, at least be an artist professionally or be at all involved in the art world. I didn't even really know growing up in New Orleans that, like, what the art world was or like what kind of jobs you would even get in said world. Um, I was always an activist growing up, and uh, I was involved in the anti-Iraq war movement and president of the Green Society at school and a bunch of stuff like that. And so I went to college, I, I came up here, um, graduated the year after Hurricane Katrina, uh, and uh, came up to New, to New York, graduated from high school, came up to New York, went to Columbia, and thought I was 
probably going to go into poli sci or something like that because it seemed like the thing to do. And I took one class and was like, oh, no. <laughs> like, this is terrible. Um, I can't be in this world. So I ended up falling into anthropology. And the whole while I was taking art classes, you know, just for the hell of it, I, you know, started dappling in um, in uh, print photography and film photography and uh, printmaking and just like taking all kinds of classes and I realized one day, oh, well I actually have the makings of uh, a minor. I might as well just do that. And I like, you know, bonded with my sculpture professor. He, re he ended up recommending that I get an internship at the Sculpture Center in Long Island City and I ended up doing that. And uh, then uh, getting a job at Judd Foundation, uh, which is the legacy foundation for the artist Donald Judd um, that has, uh, that manages his historic home in, in Soho. Uh, so have no idea really when this tra like, uh, trajectory changed. But then, you know, in 2011, uh, one year after I graduated from college uh, and was working in, in uh, Soho at Judd for the last year, Occupy Wall Street happened and I, um, decided to nix a lot of the images of Occupy Wall Street because they're all kind of weird and people know about that anyway, right? Uh, it was a movement that um, launched in 2011. Um, it was a response to a lot of international movements everywhere from Chile to Spain uh, to the UK and all of these places that were really, um, uh, you know, set on fire by uh, the Arab Spring, um, which started when Mohamed Borowisa, um, a fruit vendor in Tunisia, decided that um, he had had enough of uh, the, the Fran French-supported uh, dictatorship of Ben Ali. So Occupy Wall Street was this incredible movement. Um, thousands upon thousands of people came to uh, Zuccotti Park, which is a private public uh, space in, um, in the financial district downtown and uh, decided to try to figure out a new way of kind of doing society. You know, decided that, well, in this country uh, where we don't have basic things like healthcare, uh, like housing, like food, uh, like education, childcare, et cetera, well, we can come together and we can provide all of those, uh, all of, all of those resources for ourselves. And so um, a ton of different working groups were born. Um, people created a, a kitchen and served three delicious meals a day. Uh, people started a people's library. There was a medical center. There was a, a barber shop. Uh, and there was free childcare. And it brought together a ton of folk who were really, you know, um, trying to shed some of the social baggage that we all have, you know? Like, we all come from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, we have a variety of privileges and disadvantages. Um, and a lot of um, strain and stress and stigmas and, and prejudices. And so, of course, you know, we don't, you don't lose all of that when you come into a movement space. In fact, a lot of it gets exacerbated. So there was a lot to work out. Um, and it was an opportunity for a lot of creativity. And a lot of the people who were in that space were creatives, whether they defined themselves as artists or not. Uh, so this is a piece by Rachel Shragis, who is a New York-based artist. And uh, she was mapping something called the Declaration of Occupy Wall Street. And what we all decided, it was like a several week long, like intense collective process to come up with um, our declaration. But it is um, essentially, a breakdown of what we see as being all of the fundamental um, social, ecological, um, and political crises that are bogging down our society, that triggered the 2008 financial collapse, that are leading to uh, oppression of people of color, of um, queer people, of indigenous people here and around, around the world. Um, and uh, all of these things are interconnected through capitalism. So that was the sort of central organizing force. Um, and around, like, Occupy Wall Street was essentially um, a general assembly where everyone would come together and vote um, and make decisions. And it was orbited by a number of working groups that dealt with all of these different uh, elements of the crisis of neoliberalism. And one of these groups was Arts and Culture Working Group. And uh, so I was really involved in, in Arts and Culture. 
And uh, we did a lot of things, every, everything from uh, creating massive puppets uh, for marches, uh, creating signage posters, banners, organizing space uh, to um, start talking about the way that our cultural institutions and artists themselves are also complicit in perpetuating global inequities. Uh, and a group came out of arts and culture called Occupy Museums. And uh, I started working with them, and uh, we and continue to work with this group to this day. Occupy Museums was originally formed as an action-based group. Uh, we uh, started in solidarity with uh, the Teamster art handlers of Sotheby's, um, who were being locked out of their jobs uh, at Sotheby's um, auction house the same year that the CEO made $6.8 million in his personal salary. Um, Sotheby's decided that they no longer wanted to offer benefits to their art handlers who had been working there for, um, for decades, some of them, uh, and decided to break the union. So we came out um, in protest and we started to do a lot of actions uninvited at various cultural institutions uh, like the MoMA. Uh, like Freeze Art Fair when they came to New York from the UK and decided to not use unionized uh, labor for the construction of their tent. Um, and we're critiquing not just uh, labor practices, but also the entire system of commodified art and culture. Really saying that our crisis of capitalism is not just a political crisis, it's not just an economic crisis, it's a cultural crisis. And we have to address that. We need to change our culture and change the way that our institutions um, essentially extract from our cultures and, and, and sell that as, as saleable, commodifiable objects, asset classes for speculation on the market. Um, we really are talking about that our cultural institutions, our museums, our community centers, our public spaces, they are funded by public dollars and they need to be accessible to the public. Uh, they need to be able to uh, reflect the myriad of cultural manifestations in this country. They need to be um, open and accessible. They cannot be $25 per person you know, for entry. And so we really started to explore, all right, well, why is it that our culture is so corroded? Why is it so exclusive? To whom is the cultural institution indebted? Is it to the public or to its funders? Um, you kind of get a hint here. This is the recently inaugurated, well, recently, I guess almost three years ago now, uh, David H. Koch Plaza at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, we declared that our cultural institutions today are really uh, houses of the 1%. They are uh, not public institutions. They are rather uh, seats where the, where the global elite come and park their money in the form of art assets for the sake of the appreciation of, val of their value um, and the hoarding of uh, our wealth, both monetary wealth and cultural wealth and social wealth. So David H. Koch, for those who don't know, uh, is uh, a billionaire. He um, is the heir of uh, Koch uh, Industries, which is a giant oil and, and gas conglomerate. Um, he used to be on the board of the American Museum of Natural History and was recently kicked off. Uh, we encountered him uh, a couple of years ago when we were doing a five hour long uh, ritual performative protest of uh, the $65 million donation he made to the Met which allowed him to uh, secure his name in gold on the side of uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts New Fountains. We had no idea he was gonna be there. It was really bizarre. Uh, we uh, ended up chasing him down the steps and uh, the Met ended up blocking off uh, the steps with police barricades. I was just by the Met the other day and like they never used to have police barricades just like always on hand there. Um, so I don't know if that was uh, something that we, we triggered. Uh, but so we had a five hour long like sort of uh, performative cleansing of the plaza where we called, you know, 
for the, the cleansing of the stench of, of pollution from this temple of art and culture. We called for the repatriation of stolen ritual objects that are um, being hoarded within the Metropolitan Museum. Um, and we did a collaboration with the Illuminator, um, calling on the connection between Coke, his name, and uh, the dirty oil industry that is sabotaging our ecology. Uh, I really love the fact that he donated $65 million to the Met because um, 65 million is the number of years since the world's uh, last mass extinction. So there's some really great poetry in there. Um, so this is back to like one of the first projects we ever did. As I mentioned, uh, we started off as an action group and then one day uh, we got an invitation from Momenta Art which was a small um, emerging artist gallery in Bushwick um, that had been there, had been established for a couple of decades and uh, is now gone, unfortunately. They invited us to do an exhibition and we we're like, what, we don't do exhibitions, we're an activist group that happens to work within the medium of art. Um, but we we're like, all right, well, it sounds like an interesting opportunity. What, what would happen? All right, well, let's look at Momenta Art and see if there's anything that seems weird that maybe we want to call out. They were a pretty dope organization. They actually were pretty solid. But we noticed that they received funding from Bloomberg Philanthropies, which was a uh, former uh, three-term Mayor Bloomberg's um, private philanthropy. So we started to do a lot of research into Bloomberg Philanthropies and found a ton of really sketchy shit. For one, he holds a lot of his money in offshore tax shelters, which is a way for him to avoid actually paying any taxes on his income. It's a really convenient ploy that a lot of wealthy art patrons uh, do. They'll, you know, make a, a nice, friendly, generous donation to charities, um, which allows them to avoid paying taxes and is a really sweet PR opportunity that, you know, allows them to not have to budget for PR from their corporate fund. Uh, there are also a lot of really strange donations for an organization that is focused largely on uh, New York, um, so you know, supposedly mitigating poverty and so providing support for the arts. They also were building uh, roads in Kazakhstan, and it's like, all right, well, that's a little odd. I don't really know how that fits in with, with your mission. Um, and we really put together this whole thesis that Bloomberg, who had been um, uh, massively cutting uh, funding for, you know, everything from LGBT centers to after, uh, after school care, uh, elder care, even the police and firefighters, you know, who uh, people in his ilk usually pretend to at least care about um, having, having jobs, and, and the arts. And, at the same time, he and his charity were providing a ton of funding to all of these sectors. So it seemed to us to be a really great opportunity for him, uh, someone who was uh, an opportunist for the consolidation of power, to really cut money from uh, the public sphere so that wealthy individuals wouldn't have to contribute to supporting uh, public services and then uh, just be able to, to cover that, well, not even all of the gap, but a, a very small percentage of that gap with his charity uh, and then get all the accolades. So we ended up putting uh, his, in the Bloomberg Philanthropies 990 on the wall, um, highlighting creepy points. It was a really like slap shot kind of installation and I don't have good photos. We never took good photos. This is the first thing we ever did in like a gallery space. It was weird and we like were not even, think we did never think that we would need to be documenting this, uh, this history. Um, and we've done a ton of other collaborations uh, since then. Uh, there's a project called Gulf Labor, uh, which stands for Glo Global Ultra Luxury Factor, and uh, Occupy Museums has worked with them on their campaign to call out the Guggenheim, the Louvre, and the Abu Dhabi for the construction of uh, their three new satellite cultural sites on Sadiat Island in Abu Dhabi, uh, where one construction worker died a day uh, from unsafe labor conditions. It was a essentially a debt prison. Uh, their passports would be taken upon arrival. They would have to pay a recruitment fee, which they were told would be refunded, but often never was. Uh, so, so Gulf Labor, which is a coalition of folk from a lot of other different Occupy groups, including the Illuminator, 
uh, including MTL, including members of Occupy Museums, got together um, and did a series of, of actions calling out uh, the, these practices. Um, another collaboration between Occupy Museums, the Gorilla Girls and the Illuminator, calling out the Whitney Museum for being built on top of the Spectra frat gas pipeline. And we started to think about art fairs and how art fairs are a really um, precarious uh, uh, sort of situation for artists. They're, they're really a trap, a debt trap. On the one hand, you know, artists, you all, young people, um, are trying to figure out how to make it in the world, you know, how, how to become professional artists, how to be able to support yourselves, um, how to get the skills you need. So you go to grad school and you get your MFA, oftentimes extraordinarily expensive. In fact, seven of the ten uh, most expensive uh, grad programs in this country are art programs. Uh, and when you graduate from, from grad school, uh, you're told that you need to get a gallery, and the gallery will usually take 50% um, of the proceeds from your work. And that gallery feels that they need to be present in these art fairs that have started to really proliferate and pop up all over, all over the country in rapid succession. Uh, and they, the gallery will go twenty to $50,000 in debt just to rent their booth at this art fair. Uh, and artists will then have to make work that is guaranteed to sell because the gallery is depending on them to make that investment back. And so there starts to be a really um, destructive cycle whereby artists have to constantly regurgitate the same type of easily saleable, commodifiable work oriented toward the uh, audience of uh, these art fairs who are very you know, high wealth individuals, uh, and you start to see these trends, we'll call them, that take over the art world where people are just creating the same type thing. Um, and so we wanted to really start uh, thinking, we were inspired a lot by an organization called Strike Debt and their project, The Rolling Jubilee, which sought to, uh, sought to find a way to collectively um, bail out the public out of debt. And we started to think about how it might work um, within an art context. And the project has evolved a lot uh, since then, but essentially it is an exhibition uh, strategy as well as uh, an organizing platform uh, that groups artists together and their work together, not according to aesthetic commonalities, um, but according to their economic realities. Um, and we learn about these economic realities through a pretty intense questionnaire that asks about uh, the artist's debt and how their economic reality actually affects their artistic practice. Um, whether they went into debt in order to create their work, whether their art is um, visually affected by the, um, by the stress or anxiety or guilt that their, that, uh, their debt creates, whether they feel they have a sense of alienation um, to which financial institutions are these artists in debt? Um, the idea was originally to embed debt fair somehow within um, an actual art fair, and we did these models and prototypes for it. Uh, and Jenny Ash um, and uh, Michael Pe Peplon, I can't remember his last name, uh, from Art League of Houston saw this, uh, this project, this proposal, which was also at Momenta Art. Um, and decided that they wanted to give it a shot uh, for us to install it at Art League Houston. This is one of the detail of the model. And so we did an open call for Houston-based artists and got 58 respondents. Um, and so we created uh, these four different bundles on the wall. Um, the slash um, is a bundle of artists who we, we asked them to use words to uh, describe what emotions their debt elicits. And overwhelmingly, people said stress, anxiety, and fear. So that's a bundle of artists um, who use those words to describe their debt. Uh, the triangle are artists who have gallery representation. It was the smallest bundle. The large rectangle are all artists uh, who are in debt to um, and is grouped by the financial institutions uh, to whom they are in debt. And then the circle here are all artists who say that art is their career, yet work multiple precarious jobs in order to make ends meet. Some details. Um, and then uh, most recently, we really uh, bizarrely and incredibly got 
uh, an invitation from the Whitney Biennial to produce this project, which was unexpected and a really a, a huge honor and also a really incredible platform um, for this issue to be deeply embedded in a luxury institution of contemporary art. For this iteration, we actually framed the project around BlackRock, Inc., which is the world's largest asset management corporation. Um, they have one point trillion dollars in assets um, that on hand, and they have 15 trillion dollars in assets under management. So that's all of the investments that they actually, all of the asset-backed securities that they are holding. 15 trillion is larger than the U.S. economy. So BlackRock is essentially the largest economic superpower in the world. Um, it is run by Larry Fink, um, who also sits on the board of, among many other institutions, uh, President Trump's Strategic and Policy Forum, the Museum of Modern Art, New York University, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, as well as a pro-austerity ad hoc coalition that lobbies Congress called Fix the Debt. They call for the elimination of social security um, and other forms of so-called welfare. Um, he's also a member of Kappa Beta Phi, which is a secretive Wall Street fraternity filled with all the bigwigs that you'll ever hear of. Um, and so BlackRock is one of the majority owners of um, many more than this, but on the wall here, uh, three different categories of institutions to whom the 30 artists on the wall are in debt. And we chose these categories so that we could really show three of the anchors of the debt crisis uh, in America today. Focusing on America because, you know, the Whitney is, the biennial is the largest showcase um, or the, the showcase of, you know, what is American art today? Well, American art and uh, American artists are in debt. Uh, so on the far left are uh, 10 artists who are in debt to uh, either First Bank of Puerto Rico, Banco Popular, um, or are directly affected by the Puerto Rican debt crisis, um, which has been really perpetrated by the um, very unequal and predatory um, uh, uh, so-called protectory system that we have in place with Puerto Rico. They are effectively a colony of the United States and do not have full voting rights. Um, the second, the middle bundle is Navient Inc., which is uh, the new um, lending arm of, of Sally May, uh, so the largest student loan lender in the country. And then on the far right is J.P. Morgan Chase, um, so credit card debt and, and mortgage debt. Um, and we have um, 30 incredible artists on the wall here. Um, these works were chosen first because of their um, uh, debt, their, the commonalities um, they had in, in, in their economic realities. So the fact that they were in debt to these um, four organizations. And then we were looking to really choose a selection of artists who represented the the diversity of, um, of, artist, of artist experiences. So really recognizing that while debt is something that provokes um, intense feelings of shame and alienation that really divides people, it makes people feel like they have to be silenced and that they can't communicate about it. Um, in reality, debt is something that connects all of us. Because even if we are so lucky to not have personal debt that comes from student loans, that comes from a mortgage, that comes from a car note, that comes from medical debt, we are all connected through our debt as an entire society to colonies of the United States, to the enslaved people who built this country, to the indigenous people whose land was usurped um, and whose resources were extracted for the creation of this country. Uh, and so there is no personal debt. There is only collective debt. And we as Occupy Museums are calling for a radical redistribution of wealth. Um, we're calling for um, a, a, a radical um, um, eradication of debt. Um, individual artists are, they are, have many differing opinions. Some feels, feel that all debt should be paid back. Others are in default from economic necessity. Others are in protest and will not pay their debts back. Um, we believe that 
the earth cannot find balance until reparations are paid. Here are some details. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is one of the um, uh, funders of the Whitney Biennial, and they got a private tour before it opened, uh, even before it opened to the artists in the show. And apparently they are not happy uh, about the fact that their logo is on the wall. Um, we learned from the director of the museum that they um, were starting to get cold feet and he needed to talk them off a ledge and remind them that when MoMA censored Diego Rivera, uh, they have never, they have ne for, for criticizing Rockefeller, they've never lived it down. Um, and he said that it seems that they are not going to pull their sponsorship. Um, this is a map that we did for the project. Um, on the left are the 138 financial institutions to whom the 500 artists who all are a part of Debt Fair, who all signed, did our questionnaire and signed up during our open call period, uh, to whom they are indebted. Um, on the right side are asset management companies, hedge funds, um, investment companies, uh, that are the majority owners of these banks. So each bank has five majority owners and we draw lines to them. And you can see um, on the right that there are five asset management companies uh, that are the majority owners of the vast majority of this debt. Actually, 80% of this debt is majority owned by five corporations, the largest of which is BlackRock, uh, who uh, are majority owners of 70%. Um, of this debt. There's some uh, comments um, from the questionnaires framing the document. On the right side are manifesto uh, and uh, some information about it. Um, we're going to get this up on our website pretty soon and it'll be available for download. Um, details are still blurry. Um, it was a real bitch drawing all those lines. This other project that I, I work on in New Orleans is called Blights Out. Um, we founded it in 2014 uh, when I was working at Prospect. Um, it was co-founded uh, with uh, Lisa Siegel, who is actually a New York-based artist, and Carl Joe Williams, who's a New Orleans-based artist. Lisa was one of the invited artists of P3. Um, her work always revolves around architecture as a social code, um, representing how a society uh, genuinely feels about uh, its most vulnerable people. And she wanted to do a project around the vast ab abundance of blight that is um, blanketing our city. Uh, we don't have exact estimates because the city stopped a study that was going to reveal how much blight there was, but it's somewhere between 20 and 50,000 properties. Um, and we wanted to figure out a way that we could um, use our, our creative uh, strategies to actually address light to make it, you know, there's a, there's a whole process during which people kind of stop seeing the blight because it's such an eyesore, it's such a strain. Um, people try to deal with it, they try to get the city to, to take care of it, they try to get the owners to take care of it, they clean it up for years and after years it just becomes a complete stressor and they stop seeing it and it just sinks into the fabric. Um, of the environment. So we wanted to make it visible again, but not as an eyesore or a health hazard, but actually as um, a vessel for future life. So our project is trying to actually acquire blighted property um, to turn it into uh, ideally a mixed use um, building that will house both uh, below market rentals and community organizing space around the issues of blight gentrification and housing affordability. Um, it's been, and we've done a, a, a series of different types of um, performances, um, of um, uh, actions, painting projects. This one, this is Katrina Andrea, a local artist. Um, this neighborhood, uh, it's called Upper Treme, is being rapidly gentrified. There is a massive auction of hundreds of properties. Uh, neighbors were starting to freak out about all of these um, non-local white people coming into the neighborhood and taking photographs of all of the blighted properties that they were hoping to purchase and were terrified that it was going to be a massive land grab. Thankfully, due to a lot of pressure, the city pulled most of those properties off of the auction list. 
But we wanted to sort of do um, the inverse of that, and we brought a bunch of local black artists uh, into the neighborhood with easels to set up to paint portraits of the blighted properties, using it as an opportunity for uh, conversation with residents about what they were going through and about our project and our hopes for, for the future. Um, a lot of those uh, pieces came, were, were further worked on and um, were displayed at an exhibition at Antenna um, where we both work. Um, it was curated by Carl Joe. And we also do something called Design as Protest, um, which is a workshop that brings together um, activists, artists, uh, architects, and, and re just residents, ordinary people, um, to workshop um, interventionary-based uh, solutions to various social justice problems. So how can architecture, how can the built environment, how can interventions, how can protests come together um, and, and uh, actually work to, to remedy um, some of the problems of police brutality, um, of uh, gerrymandering, uh, of, um, and, and therefore voter disenfranchisement, um, of blighted property and gentrification. Uh, so we've done this now four times um, and uh, have some really great projects from the last one. We did one on uh, Inauguration Day um, as a, a form of um, really using strategy as, as a form of protest. Um, and we did a series of yard signs and billboards um, that are going around the city. Uh, there was, it was a year-long, almost year-long process of a series of, of meetings, of story circles, um, of, of visioning to try to come up with, with these slogans. Um, that were then collectively voted on um, and designed uh, in conjunction with uh, Young Creative Agency, which is a local nonprofit that uh, trains and pays youth to do design work. Um, um, so the last thing that we did was uh, this, we're doing this project called the Living Glossary. And our idea is that you know, we often use words without actually understanding the definitions of them, what they actually mean. Uh, words like gentrification, development, community. Um, and we wanted to really start to parse through uh, these development terms uh, to start with their official definition and context, um, to expand it through historical grounding, and to really flesh it out and enliven them uh, through oral histories with uh, residents who have actually had to deal with that term, that concept in real life, and how it actually manifests. So Auction is the first poster we did. We started, um, and they're all going to be included in a People's Development Toolkit that we're working on um, that will culminate the project. And uh, we started with Auction, you know, thinking, well, auctions are an incredibly predatory, um, market-oriented means of um, acquiring and, and transferring property um, that is extremely problematic in New Orleans right now. And of course, you know, New Orleans is the, the, um, the national uh, seat of the slave trade. So we, we knew that uh, there are going to be some really interesting parallels between the slave auction and the property auction. We had no idea that there is actually a direct lineage uh, from uh, the, the city's largest slave auctioneer to the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority and the City Planning Commission, um, a direct lineage of individuals um, and relationships. So that's what this uh, project is exploring. The other side is a scan of a newspaper from 1832. Um, uh, it's, a, and it's a page of all of the auctions, uh, everything from land, to horses and cows, to paintings, to, um, to um, uh, what do you call it, uh, China, uh, to human beings. All right. So now we're going to get together um, and talk about antenna um, and tag team us. And then we'll, we'll start a conversation and um, a dialogue with all of you. So uh, Antenna started as a, um, an organization post-Katrina in 2005. 
um, as uh, and both of us uh, were not involved in the inception of the organization, but it was really a way for artists and writers to do something other than rebuilding. And so um, one of the first projects that they produced was Drawathon. It's a 24-hour art making event, and it was uh, started the year after Katrina. Um, so we're now in our uh, we'll be in our 13th iteration of it um, this next year. And um, it was a way for artists um, to just get together and make things. We now have 1,500 people that come throughout a day and just uh, it's all commune on the act of making things. So we have different prompts throughout the day. Um, at the bottom there you can see put a bird on it. So by the end of the day, um, there are about 500 bird drawings on that little piece of um, a branch. Um, we also started, the organization started a, as a publisher and, and we continue that um, today. So they're all uh, publications that we produce um, at the intersection of visual and literary arts, um, sometimes leaning on in either direction. Right now we're working on a book um, with a local comic artist, uh, John Slade. Um, this project he's been working on for about 10 years, and this is an anthology of the six books he's produced since um, for those last 10 years. Um, this is our home on St. Claude Ave. Um, so uh, in 2009, so the organization started as a roving organization, and then in 2009 uh, got a space um, and then we were, uh, we were pushed out because of gentrification in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, we were very fortunate to secure this location um, with a 10-year lease and an amazing landlord who loves our mission. Um, so the upstairs, we have a gallery space. Downstairs, we have a reading room and workshop space where we produce all the publications. Um, and then in the back of the building, we also have a residency space to host artists and writers. Um, this is the gallery space, and this is actually one of the first um, exhibitions I curated with um, fellow artists who run the space. Um, it's collectively run, so we have um, uh, currently 12 artists who curate and select the work um, that we produce in the space. Um, this was uh, in celebration of the end of days, the, end, the Mayan end calendar, and so these are all artists uh, working in some way with the apocalypse. Um, uh, this is uh, Amanda Cassingham Bardwell um, in her hoarder collection. Um, and then this is a, uh, a selection from our annual open call, um, which uh, we do have um, some ephemera for that. Um, we do an international national open call for artists projects. Um, this is Yoshi Sakai, she was uh, selected in 2015. Um, and this has been Fox McCord's work. He's one of our collective members. I just threw that in there because I like that piece. <laughs> uh, we do a lot of performances and projects um, uh, that, uh, that operate at the intersection of visual or literary arts. This is a reading um, uh, with uh, Layla McCullough, who's uh, the cellist for the Carolina Chocolate Drops. She, uh, did a performance um, for one of our readings and it was amazing. Um, uh, Jason Lazarus uh, doing a talk in the gallery space for a photo exhibition. Um, we also seek out other spaces in the community. So um, this was an artist talk with uh, Doreen Garner who uh, showed with us last year and was a selection for the open call. And um, uh, this was at the uh, New Orleans Pharmacy Museum. And then uh, this is in a former garage, um, a reading uh, with our uh, literary arm, uh, Room 220. And then we've also been heavily involved in the development of Common Field. Um, we hosted in 2013 the, uh, the annual convening, which at the time was called Hand and Glove. It's now called the Common Field Convening. So I would check out uh, on commonfield.org, um, the website. Um, there are over 500 organizations from all over the country um, that are artist-run or artist-centric. And 
Uh, it, it is a really inspiring group to be a part of, um, just to see how artists are operating throughout the country and developing new, new strategies for artists to engage. Um, and then we're also an incubator, um, and that's how we, um, we uh, first met Imani. Um, we, uh, we started with this project. This is from uh, a, an organization called Big Class, um, and they uh, were very interested in encouraging uh, students in New Orleans uh, to uh, get excited about creative writing. Uh, very much inspired by um, A26, um, and now they're in uh, A26 development, um, and they'll be opening their haunting supply company um, here uh, in the next year. Um, if you're not familiar with A26, you can go to uh, the Superhero Supply Center here in Brooklyn. Um, it's really worth checking out. And um, okay, so Platforms is uh, one of the um, member organizations of the Andy Warhol Foundation Regranting Program, which is a great way for large philanthropies to recognize that they are not the best people to make it, to be making funding decisions for organizations across the country that they have no connection with. So they started to work uh, in partnership with organizations like Antenna, um, as well as 15 uh, or so other cities, um, to give us money this year, $60,000, that we then uh, redistribute to artists for grants of up to $5,000. So uh, this is a project, um, no CAS, um, that's one of the first funded projects. Um, they're the Comic and Zine Festival. Um, uh, this is... This is Alleged Lesbian Activities, which uh, is a uh, play that traces back, uh, that works with the Dyke Bar History Project in New Orleans. Um, New Orleans is an incredible um, queer mecca, uh, yet due to a number of factors, all of the dyke bars in the city have closed. Uh, there are zero uh, left, and so they were going back, um, talking with uh, members of the community to like trace back people's stories and the history of what happened to them and turned it into a really tour de force play. And they, they produced a, um, a podcast that's really incredible with interviews of people who experienced the dyke bars, and um, it's so worth checking out. So it's called um, Alleged, lesbian, Alleged activities. A lesbian Activities, so check that out. Okay, sculpture, we're just gonna go. <laughs> That's a skate park that had a skatable sculpture. Um, and then Imani's project with Blights Out, they were also a funded um, project within, uh, within the Platforms Fund, and that's, that's how we built, built our relationship with this amazing woman. So we do Signals, which is a uh, so-called li live arts magazine, which is a spread of six to eight artists, writers, scientists, scholars, activists, uh, et cetera, who we bring together around a common theme um, for 10 minute, super quick presentations of their work and showing how, uh, as, you know, we usually think that we operate in these silos, but in actuality, our work is a lot more interconnected than we would ever dream. Um, here's one of the events. Um, this is uh, um, Richard McMahon. Yeah, this is the this is the work of Richard McMahon, who works in miniature um, from one of our exhibitions. Um, he was uh, one of the speakers at one of the signals. More signals, more. Um, we have a residency program. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 giving you all the things. So just know that. Um, so uh, so we started this program with uh, Tavares Strawn and his project uh, for Prospect Three. Um, he had approached, he was originally uh, just a visiting artist with us and then was invited to be a part of uh, Prospect 3 and so we sort of piloted our residency program and the way we operate with um, resident artists and writers. And so we helped to facilitate um, at nearly every step this project um, from securing the barge to helping with Neon to also developing a phone app um, which uh, worked with uh, famous tour guide Speed Levitch um, in uh, doing uh, tours of, of the history of belonging in New Orleans through the lens of, of this project. Um, and then have since worked with now um, several artists. Um, we're currently working with uh, Molly Rideout, who has embedded herself in a 
uh, transient community in the lower nine. Um, this was one of her readings at a crawfish boil because we like to eat too um, during these. This is uh, Chloe Bass who we're working with as well um, on a project around um, the regional transit authority in, in our area. Um, and uh, she's hoping to, to develop a project that will tell people's stories and their experiences of the bus system in New Orleans. And then this project, which I think you should talk about. Okay. Um, so this is Dred Scott's, uh, a mock-up from Dred Scott's project called Slave Rebellion Reenactment. Um, the 1811 slave revolt uh, in uh, Louisiana uh, went for 26 miles um, from plantation to plantation along the river. It was very nearly successful uh, in their goal of actually taking over uh, New Orleans and therefore all of Orleans territory. Um, if it had happened, the landscape of the country would be vastly different. Their intent was to set up a free country. Uh, Dred Scott wants to do a, a full-scale reenactment of this project with 500 people in period-specific costume, uh, muskets, cane knives, and blunderbusters, um, marching for two days uh, from Laplace to Kenner right outside of New Orleans, um, and it will be filmed, uh, which is how we're going to sneak it past uh, all of the uh, terrifying uh, authorities in that area and make them feel safe about it. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a massive exercise in the possibilities of freedom, uh, not only at that historic time, but today, um, to help individuals literally walk the path uh, to freedom, um, to exercise uh, the muscle memory of the fight for freedom, and uh, think about how today we can get free. And so with this project, we, we're organizing a bunch of community gatherings. So this was our initial dinner. Um, we've also done artist talks, uh, and we're partnering with several other organizations, the Contemporary Arts Center, uh, Tulane, uh, Xavier University. Um, uh, this is a, a packed house crowd um, for, that, for that talk with Angela Kinlaw. Um, and then we also helped to facilitate uh, the flag raising of this project, which some of you might be familiar with, a uh, man was lynched by police yesterday, um, uh, that, uh, that was shown for a week in New Orleans on the CAC. And then uh, this is a, a kind of mock-up now of, the, of what the costuming is gonna look like for this project. We're hoping that it'll launch in uh, the beginning of next year is the, the tentative date. And then uh, these projects, which are forthcoming. Yeah, so we are looking to organize something called Fossil Free Festival, which will be a space um, in which uh, residents of New Orleans, artists, uh, workers at cultural institutions, uh, et cetera, can come together and start to discuss what it means to take funding from the oil industry. Uh, basically, every single one of our major arts institutions in New Orleans receives uh, major oil funding, again, as an incredible PR opportunity for those oil companies. Um, but we're not going to go into it with that attitude. We want to just create a space for conversation um, because mo uh, so many of uh, New Orleans and Louisiana residents um, are actually working in or have family who work in the oil industry. It's a very tricky subject. and. Even uh, environmental organizers uh, feel uncomfortable um, broaching the subject. So we want to bring together um, members of groups such as uh, Not an Alternative, who have a natural history museum project and successfully got Coke off the board of the American Museum of Natural History with the group Liberate Tate, who I highly recommend you check out, um, and have a space for workshops for musical performances and um, open dialogue about complicity in, in uh, climate change via accepting funds. And then we're, we're just now in the infancy of uh, thinking about an, an uh, alternative to education, um, particularly uh, the MFA model. Um, with a with a new program, so we went we we attended this um, past year the alternative art school 
um, fair, which uh, happened at Pioneer Works. I hope that they do it again. Um, it's worth checking out um, if you're interested at all in arts education and the future of it. So w that's, it's, we're, it's, it's right now just a, a glimmer in the future that we're aiming towards. Um, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna open it up to um, questions. Here, we'll zoom back to like, to, to this. Maybe we'll put it on Ben, that'll be a good stopping point. Okay, so um, we'll open it up for questions. Sorry, we, th we threw a lot at you, but please feel free to ask questions. Could you elaborate on opportunities for artists and artist residencies with your group? Yeah, so um, for uh, non-local artists, we have a national and international open call that is currently open. Um, so y'all should grab these cards. Um, and the open call provides a solo exhibition in our space. Uh, it provides a uh, $1,000 uh, stipend for um, nationally um, based artists. Uh, it provides a catalog. Um, yeah. yeah, so you can produce a, an, a, a, an artist book as a part of the project. Um, you get travel and um, accommodations and, accommodations and uh, shipping for your work, which is often uh, not provided with many open call opportunities. Um, and as an artist-run organization, we recognize that that's, uh, that's, uh, that often makes or breaks an opportunity, so that was really important for us. Um, we also, we do have a residency program. Um, it's, uh, it's built though for, um, for artists who are working uh, outside of school at least five years. So um, look to that in five years. <laughs> um, we also though, uh, we have an open invite that we offer to artists um, or writers coming through the city. Um, you can come and stay with us uh, for free for up to five days um, in our residency space. Uh, so you can make your own residency in New Orleans and come and crash with us. I wonder if both of you could comment on the discrepancy between the groups of audiences between some of the large performance pieces uh, and a lot of the small ones. Now, in the small ones, there were a great deal of minority representation, but in the places like concerts and gallery things, there wasn't. And how are you uh, drawing in uh, disadvantaged communities into those spaces? Um, I think that's not entirely the case. Um, actually, our largest ever attended event was at the CAC and had like a, a bunch of people of color. I don't know like exact numbers, but I mean, like, yeah, it's like a very real reality that you know um, attendees of arts institutions across the country are 80% white. Um, that is something that is really, you know, is a, is a huge problem. It has a lot to do with access to arts education um, starting from a young age. Um, it's not provided in public schools, especially in New Orleans, and people are discouraged from engaging with it. It's seen as a, a weekend activity um, at best rather than um, an actual valuable um, uh, way of developing oneself as a person. Um, beyond that, arts institutions as a whole, um, like we, you know, when I grew up in New Orleans, we used to go to plantations uh, for field trips, but we wouldn't really go to arts museums. And so children are not, um, are not taught to feel comfortable in those spaces. They have the same feeling that a lot of like, you know, I, I often compare arts institutions to somebody else's church where one would not just walk into someone else's church if they didn't have a direct invitation. Um, and they have that kind of, you know, like temple-esque, austere, um, exclusive sort of feel. And it's um, something that I think, you know, 
we are always conscious of and trying to work against. Um, I think it's also the case that, you know, like, people of color increasingly today are really not interested in being in um, what are considered as white spaces a lot of the time. And uh, there, there is a, a lot of sort of like self-siloing that is, that is happening. And I think that that's something that, you know, um, yeah, that sometimes people need to, um, yeah, feel the need to be with people who look like them. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's, the best way to be, um, but yeah, these are all some of the different different reasons. We have a, a range of programming that bring in a range of people from lots of different backgrounds. We have a mailing list that includes and a board that includes um, people from a diversity of uh, ethnicities and uh, backgrounds, and yeah. I mean, with our with the, one of our most recent programs, signals. Um, the live action art magazine that we were talking about, we were really conscious of this issue of, uh, of people being invited into a space. This, this idea of like uh, offering, offering the space up versus invite and, um, and actually involving peop uh, people from all kinds of different um, academic pursuits or um, uh, uh, jobs or like working in science or uh, you know focused on on wildlife like those those people bringing all of those kind of audiences together it brings uh, it it roots the organization um, and allows the audience to feel ownership in a way that we can't get in any other kind of programming um, also, uh, having some sort of education component, so our involvement with Big Class was huge in terms of um, uh, having the neighborhood take ownership of the organization that um, it hadn't had in the, in the past. Um, and then also our annual drawathon, which sees, you know, 1,500 people throughout a, a full day um, ranging from all kinds of different backgrounds, um, from kids to you know, like elderly to everything in between. So it's um, it's a it's a, a really beautiful program that um, allows us to to um, bring people into the organization in a way that we couldn't do otherwise. So you're next, Josh. So um, thanks so much. I really enjoyed both your presentations and learning about everything you do. Um, just FYI, you know, this is probably number 22 or something like that of weekly talks. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm sure you guys are all feeling s slightly burnt at this point. <laughs> but we're going to charge, uh, charge through. Um, yeah. So my f I got two questions, and one is kind of... Um, gentle, and the other one's going to be a little bit more challenging for Imani. Okay. Um, so, so we have a, we have a workshop that Matthew Delegate um, teaches, a professional development, development workshop called Artists as Catalyst. Yeah. And um, Sharon Loudon, who recently, you know, published her, the book she edited called Artists as Culture Producer, is joining our faculty. And I'm a big believer in what one might consider um, innovative or alternative career paths for artists where instead of, you know, renting a studio and, and making your work and hoping that Larry Gagosian taps you on the shoulder and takes care of everything, um, that you go out and, and try to, you know, help produce the art world you want to participate in. You both seem like great models for that. And so my, my first question is really just about you. Um, you sort of trace your paths, but how's it working and what advice would you have for people who are about to graduate from school, many of them, probably seven out of ten, with a boatload of debt. You know, how do you how do you get how do you get by and do something different from, you know, waiting tables or um, trying to get you know one of the three tenure track teaching positions positions in the country, or you know trying to you know make a run of it selling art. So. Um uh, first, uh, first off, uh, income-based repayment. 
Like, that's, like, awesome. I don't know if you guys know about this, but if you're broke, you, like, you can just, like, sit on those loans for as long as you want. Um, and I'm still sitting on my loans from school. But you have you know? to be in touch with the, with, with the lenders and renegotiate and, and actually actively participate in those programs. Yeah. Right? That's Otherwise true. Otherwise, you get tagged. Yeah. No, yeah. that's it. So it's not – you don't want to default. And actually – like the 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 biggest like nuts and bolts thing like consolidate as much of your debt into the um, it's the the federal uh, the federal program um, that will allow you to do income based loan repayment um, that's like the f number one thing you should do if, if you have any private debt like c try and get it consolidated into the direct loan system because um, if if all things go well that you can sit on that, that debt for a while and then it will eventually be forgiven if you work in certain fields. So for instance, for us, like it may, I don't, if, if we're lucky, um, if like a certain administration doesn't take it away from us, um, <laughs> we uh, like working in the nonprofit world and that includes like teaching and all of those kind of things, you, you can have that debt forgiven eventually um, if you're poor and broke and, um, <laughs> and struggling for that long, which most artists are. Even, even successful artists that you think are like, like um, uh, you know, blue chip artists, a lot of them are struggling. So you should just know that that's like a thing that is in your future as an artist. <laughs> I don't want to sugarcoat that. Um, I, and I've also, um, uh, I've done a lot of different hustles. So um, uh, right out of, uh, off of the bus. So we were very fortunate um, in that we um, were able to secure the bus. It was like um, on, uh, like we got on Craigslist, it was like $3,000. We could kind of pull that together. And then we built this, this space and environment and um, we ran it on waste vegetable oil, which is free. So it was often like cheaper for us to move around the country than it was to stay put. And once we, once we hit off the road, oh, I think we unplugged. Once we, yeah, there we go. So once we got off the road, um, I, we were like so broke. So it was like, we were, you know, um, washing our clothes in the bathtub broke, like, and drying them outside. Like, that's how broke we were. And so I started doing this hustle on Craigslist, um, doing uh, Ivy League remodeling is what I called it. Because, like, you could hire Ivy Leaguer to, like, fix your shit. And so I did that hustle just to be able to, like, keep doing all of the other stuff I was doing. And you just have to like be willing to do those things to keep making um, the work, and that's like that's the only recommendation I can do. Like the 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 work that I'm doing now, I'm very fortunate that I have a full time position in this organization. But I I built that position within the organization, so it didn't exist. Talk about that. I mean, I, I appreciate the stuff about debt col consolidation consolidation and Craigslist hustles. Yeah, that's not quite as compelling and synergistic <laughs> with yeah. with our goals as yeah, for the sure. other part which is being a culture producer yeah 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 for sure so um so the organization that i joined i joined it in 2011 um, as a volunteer for the organization and then just uh kept like hacking away and and doing grant writing for the organization and built up the funds for the organization to then be able to pay me a salary. So it was, um, it was fortunate that I, the organization already had a track record when I joined it. So um, often when you're building a nonprofit organization, um, you're in this sort of catch-22 where when you're starting, um, you, you have no money and you need the money from, grant, from granting organizations or from donors and they want you to first prove, you know, that you have some sort of track record. So you do have to spend um, your own time, your money. I, like when I started Redux, I was doing it on a credit card initially. Um, uh, and you do have to start it in that way where you're, you don't have the money to do it. Um, and then do one of these side hustles to keep to keep it going until it can it can kind of 
feed feed the the beast itself and create a position for you. So, and that's how I would say, you know, 99% of the artist-run organizations that exist across the country start in that way, where they it's it's a passion project for the artist. Um, and, they're, and then they eventually build it up to the point that it can actually pay the person or pay someone to actually run it and, and make it happen. So. Yeah, that's how Blights Out basically started. I mean, like I've worked as an arts um, administrator since getting out of, out of school. Um, and, you know, and it's been, it's not, it's sometimes you're, you're paid a decent, you know, wage. Sometimes you're not. Um, sometimes it's temp and, you know, you, everyone gets laid off unexpectedly. Um, and I freelanced for a year, which was actually a really great um, opportunity for me to, um, like, develop a lot of skills um, to develop my design skills. I had done public the two catalogs for Prospect, and so I started to get other catalog gigs and um, doing some like design work and artist assistant work with uh, Jackie Summel, um, who does work around the prison industrial complex. Uh, and then I was doing Blights Out as, yeah, as a passion project. And we were able to start getting some grants, like uh, and this is before I worked for Antenna, but we got the platforms grant and that allowed us to pay some artists and then we got a couple more grants and that allowed us to pay artists and I was never getting paid for it. Um, I was doing like massive amounts of like administration and grant writing and you know like organizing and like brain powering the thing along and wasn't getting any, getting any money in large part because I was anxious about paying myself. Uh, I, I was anxious about running um, a project that really felt like it it should be, you know, I, I felt like it was my responsibility to be doing that project. Um, and eventually, Bob and Antenna was our fiscal sponsor, said, um, if someone doesn't get paid to do this admin work, like, this shit is not going to actually happen. And so it's like, okay, yeah, that's like um, an awakening moment. But it's also like I've come to realize that my labor is valuable. Um, and that there is nothing shameful about receiving compensation for good work that you're doing just because it is, you know, they're, they're you know, I, and the work that I'm doing is more in the vein of mutual aid. It's, it's not charity. I'm not some wealthy person who has the labor to, to give in that way. Um, and really recognizing that a lot of, there, there's so much money, you know, um, so, so much money in philanthropies that are, is being given out to, um, you know, to various artists and that it's really great when some of that money can go to a project that is uh, dealing with housing, which is, you know, a really severe human need. Um, so I started to feel actually really good about taking philanthropist money and, and funneling it toward um, some of the gaps that are formed in, uh, like, you know, when housing, Housing organizations have very little money, and uh, they don't have, you know, money for advertising, right, and for, like, you know, messaging. And so to be able to actually, like, take that money and, and pay myself and pay designers to, like, do the campaign signs and the billboards, et cetera, um, you know, actually seemed to make sense to me. Um, I think also just in, in uh, thinking about uh, Imani's trajectory, uh, we we were working with uh, Blights Out, and then uh, like I, I recognized how important that project is, and we built a position for her. Um, but that was all based on her relationship to our organization. And often, um, you you should you sh if you're aiming to, to to develop a project or you have an idea of something that you want to develop into. A nonprofit or a not nonprofit, which is like a whole other world, um, and is a large discussion that we have at Common Field. You, um, it's best to partner with or or to seek out um, mentorship with another organization that um, is working in that world in some way, um, and they'll often uh, take you on as a fiscal sponsor. They take a little cut of your money that you bring in, you know, um, to to handle their their business, but then it also, you, you're able to 
um, build on the success and track record of that organization as a fiscally sponsored project. Now there are some, there's some larger institutions, there's like Fractured Atlas for instance that will do fiscal sponsorship for you, but that relationship is I think not as beneficial as actually getting fiscal sponsorship from a smaller nonprofit that is closer to the people that you would want to work with. That's great advice. Um, I know I'm taking a lot of air time, but I, so now I have my um, devil's advocate question for Imani. I asked yeah. this with real respect, but I think it has to be asked. Um, for Occupy Museum's participation in the Whitney Biennial after projecting like 1% on the Guggenheim and your like really critical take on museums, how can you sell out like that? Well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a fair question. I, this project in particular was designed to be embedded in a luxury art institution. That was the point of it from its inception. Um, we would never display art object, or sorry, like protest objects in a museum. I think that the display of protest objects, the display of um, literal activism as art in a museum is grotesque. Um, this is a project where we wanted to actually, like I said, it started as a proposal for an actual art fair. Um, where a gallery within an art fair would decide to um, actually remove the front of their of their drywall and embed the the work of the so-called dark matter artists, as Greg Shillette calls the the 99 percent of artists who's uh, who create all of the, the highly marketable 1% work and whose work will often never be shown in such a context and be able to actually peel the wall down once that gallery had made back their, their ceiling um, to actually remove that wall and then have that art be revealed for the remainder of that fair. Um, and that opportunity just never came around, you know, and we always, like, thought of that as just, like, we, we you know, we thought it would be a really incredible sort of... Um, way of actually visualizing what this luxury art world is built on. Um, and it was also a project that was created to be, as I said, an organizing platform so that, you know, we really believe that, like, and it's incredible to see as this, is, you know, as, as a community of artists came together around Houston and, you know, like, our, our, a lot of people remain in touch and, like, um, people coming together around this iteration and, like, understanding, like, first of all, like, being able to work through on a personal level, like, what it means to, like, have this debt and that it is not shameful, that it is something that we have in common, and then to start to think about, like, what are the possibil possibilities for leveraging one's collective power? If there are 10 of us artists who are in debt to J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, there are far more than that, but, you know, what, what, you know, can we do to start demanding, um, to start demanding debt justice? Um, we, you know, how can we use this as an opportunity to start calling on, you know, um, to, to start calling on J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, to actually um, forgive some of this debt or to say that, you know, J like a lot of this debt is illegitimate and it's based on financial Ponzi schemes that the, the banks used in order to sell these subprime mortgages, for example. And so what if we decided to call that debt illegitimate and refuse to pay it back. Um, so that's always been an anchor of the project. Um, and with the Whitney Biennial, you know, it was a weird thing when we found out that they wanted to include this project in it. And we thought, well, what better opportunity to actually realize it as it's always been intended to be embedded in one of the most luxury art institutions in the world. Um, it's a museum where uh, the first 100 of every, uh, of uh, the first 100 admissions to the museum every day um, are just going to pay off the interest on the loans that they took out to build their new building. There is no reason to build that new building. It's part of the trend in the art world now of going into debt um, and wasting an extravagant amount of resources to participate in this real estate trend, also because a lot of their board members are in real estate and it's a benefit to them. Um, and so we really did want to make this statement in that museum, um, and we think that, you know, it's it's important. We've always we've always felt that it's important to be both outside of museums and calling on them uninvited. As we had an action a few weeks ago at the MoMA, calling on MoMA to drop Larry Fink from the board. Um, we believe it's important to be outside museums, like kind of clamoring from the outside, but that there are also a lot of 
arts workers who are uncomfortable with the way things are and they want to see things change and to be working inside that and be using the museum as the public space that it really should be and as the public platform for innovative creative you know um, proposals for a different way of, of working and a different way of living um, I think it's also important to look to the work of as I mentioned uh, not an alternative um, who have the Natural History Museum project. They created a fake museum uh, so that the museum could actually become a member of the AAM, which is the American Association of Museums, which is the largest, you know, like professional uh, uh, community of, of uh, museum professionals in the country. And they all come together, they have these big conventions. And when they started um, going to these AAM conventions and meetings, they realized that a lot of museum directors across the country are very uncomfortable with the influence that the oil industry and other, um, you know, uh, disreputable interests actually have on affecting the programming and the exhibitions and the narratives about climate change and other issues in museums and wanted to see these people off the board. Uh, and so they were able to start doing organizing with these museum directors, um, using that platform, starting to do exhibitions not only uh, in, in you know, these uh, AAM conventions, but at other art museums, at uh, Project Row Houses, et cetera. And they have successfully gotten David Koch off the board of the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, they've gotten uh, some oil funding out of a museum in Salt Lake City in Utah, Liberate Tate, uh, which is, of course, an action-based organization, but whose members work, you know, um, in our curators and, and work for various institutions, have gotten BP uh, off of the Tate board. Um, Occupy Museums uh, participated in a collective action at the Louvre during the COP climate actions. We actually just recently found out that apparently at some point they dropped any off the board. Any is a French oil company. So there are so many tactics that need to be used and brought together. We can't just work along one sort of straight and narrow path. We have to use a multiplicity of tactics to deal with this like, you know, this beast because I, you know, I don't know what the, like what, where, you know, where that linchpin is gonna, is gonna be. I don't know, I don't know what is gonna be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So I think it's important that we, that we work from all sides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.